It's the Score North Twin Show. All right, Score North Extra Innings. Declan Goff here with A.J. Fredrickson. It's been a week. It's been a whole week since the last time the Minnesota Twins won a baseball game. It's also been a whole week since the Minnesota Twins drove in a runner with scoring in scoring position. So a lot of firsts. A lot of good things happening here. What's going on, everyone? My name's Declan Goff. That's A.J. Fredrickson. This is Score North Extra Innings. Uh, this is bonus content from the regular Score North Twin Show you can expect from Mackie Judd and myself and even Trevor Plouffe on Tuesdays. But uh, you can expect extra innings. Uh, content from every Twins home game, from day games. We'll kind of react right afterwards for a post-game recap. For night games, you can expect content uh, before the game in your feed. So if you're on Apple, Spotify, or you're watching on YouTube, we appreciate it. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, but Age, finally back in the win column. Yesterday, you faced Tyler Glass now, one of the nastiest pitchers in all of baseball. And thankfully, uh, the Twins didn't have to deal with Tyler Glass now today. And Edward Julian kind of helps carry them. But regardless, a little bit of an exhale. Not a, not a perfect win by any means, but at least just an exhale that you were able to finally get a big win here today against a good team in the Dodgers. What a calming win, too, Dex. I mean, if this, uh, if this turns into a sweep by the Dodgers, I mean, I don't think anybody's necessarily pressing, smashing, breaking out the panic button yet, but you're thinking about it because yeah. um, just given the streak of hitting with runners in scoring position, looking like you can't string together hits in an inning to have that kind of explosive one, about we, what we saw a week ago when they uh, had that explosive, I want to say, seventh inning against the uh, the Royals, uh, th- this was a good this was a good win. Um, this was a, a team that recognized, hey, let's go out, let's uh, start, and how about the coming out party, and I'm sure we're going to talk about him, Canadian Carew, Eddie and uh, Eddie Julian with two Oppo tacos today. Um, they they weren't the maybe the most towering of, of blasts, but boy, they got the job done. And it's nice to see him kind of find some form here after a rough couple of games. Yeah. So also one of them off a lefty, which is huge because this is a guy that had struggles last season against lefties. So I think Julian has been kind of circled here from Twins fans as my God, dude, swing the dang bat, swing the bat, swing the bat. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Edward coming into the day on StatCast, so he was actually in the 99th percentile in a good case for chase percentage, meaning he is going to not chase any pitch outside the strike zone. He's not going to swing at something that's above your head or below your knees. He is going to have a very specific area that he is going to swing in. Now there's going to be times, like we saw in the first four or five games of the year, where he's going to take a lot of strike threes. You see a lot more swing strike threes in today's baseball. Lately with Julian, you're going to see a lot more takes with strike threes. That's because he's not going to chase as much. And for better or worse, that's who he is as a hitter. Today was the better part. You saw three, uh, two home runs. He went three for four uh, with the single in there as well. He scored all three runs at the plate. He actually defensively, I think, has also made some good strides that we can talk about. But, yes, at the plate, this is who he's going to be. He's going to have some frustrating days where he takes a lot more strike threes than you'd like to see. But he's a disciplined hitter, and when he gets into his zone and he gets the pitch he wants to hit, today is the perfect example of why he's probably not going to change his philosophy for better or worse, and he carried them to the win offensively. And the, and the thing about that is, if you look at some of the exit velos, the top exit velos from the day, the Dodgers absolutely dominated this stat. They had the top six, and it wasn't until Edward Julian's um, homer in the, uh, the fifth. 104.3 off the bat. His home run in the first was only 101.7. Only a home run in 15 of 30 ballparks. So yeah. this is uh, very much a, he he knows the park. He should be familiar with the park. Um, and to your point of, he's got that, he knows what pitches he wants to hit. He knows the zone that he wants. And he's, it, it, it speaks on maybe the recognition. Because if you can pick it up out of not just a righty, but a lefty, that's, that's a guy that uh, maybe just a slower start He'll find his game and could be a big, uh, big component of the Twins' offensive lineup here, um, heading into a pretty important uh, series this early in the year against the uh, Detroit Tigers. Yeah, and defensively, he actually had a very, very good day too. He he almost turned what would have been uh, the game-ending double play. The unfortunately, Barnes did beat out that that uh, the, or not Barnes, uh, Chris Taylor. Chris What's Taylor. It, Barnes. Yeah, uh, was able be able to break beat out the the last play there, and uh, they went to review and it ended up being safe, but his defense was, was big today. Um, he's made a big effort into that. You know, Rocco Baldelli actually shared this story. I don't believe I talked to Ross about this yesterday. Um, he shared a story about how Rocco did when Rocco was playing, and he was playing in the Arizona Fall League, and Chase Utley was on his team. Chase Utley, a very prominent second baseman with the Phillies. Well, 
Utley came up as a third baseman, and let's just say he was a bit of a butcher um, at third base, and he tried like absolute hell and worked his butt off to try to be a little bit better defensively. Oh, by the way, I'm in the Legends Club right now, so if you hear all that racket that's going on, that's what that is. I'm live at Target Field. Uh, the fans have cleared out of here for the last 45 minutes, but there's still people packing things up, and that's what that obnoxious sound is, as I'm trying to illustrate an awesome point from Rocco Baldelli, so bear with me. But... Utley uh, ends up working at second base, and he put in a, so much time into it, and he ends up becoming one of the most well-known second basemen of an entire generation of baseball fans. Now, hey, if Edward Julian even becomes probably 50% of the player, 80% of the player of Chase Utley, you'll take it every single time. But he's still young enough, and he's made enough strides, I think, defensively, too, that are probably more important, where, again, you can live with some of the offensive miscues if you're going to be a positive defensive player. Yeah, and that's the thing about him. He's so early in his career, you don't necessarily need that fully formed second baseman quite yet um but he's showing a lot of promises in times and it, this is a season where i think as you get deeper into those summer months you hope that his game does grow his his uh his peaks maybe do rise and um if you see if you've seen those like over top the the different aspects where it's like defensive fielding contacting power that entire area starts to expand because you you saw that he has the power to get the ball out of the ballpark. Now it's just about start swinging the bat at the stuff that you feel comfortable and hopefully pitchers are going to put you in a position where they make a mistake and you just capitalize. And he he showed that today. If they mistake if they make mistakes, he's going to make them pay. And look, not a ton of offense from the Twins today, but at least enough to show you some type of life. Um, I know Julian mm -hmm. had a big day at the plate. Correa had a couple singles. Marco worked an excellent at bat where he took a nine pitch at bat, turns it into a walk. Second half of the game, not so great of a story. I, um, I believe 14 in a row were retired, or 14 plate appearances without a hit, I should say. There was a couple walks mixed in there. So offensively, there's still some things to probably worry about here. But, yeah, there is a, at least somewhat of an exhale as you don't get swept by the Dodgers, and we'll see what kind of happens offensively going into the Tigers. you got ace versus ace basically tomorrow in Detroit, uh, Pablo Lopez versus Cabal of the Tigers. So that's going to be a fun pitching matchup. But offensively, there were some, some decent strides there. On the pitching side, so Chris Paddock gets the ball today. Uh, the Sheriff, as he's called here, they blow the whistle, every, they blow the little Sheriff Western whistle every time he gets a big strikeout. Uh, right. Paddock goes four and two thirds, gives up six hits, two runs both earned, five strikeouts, uh, was pulled in the middle of the fifth. He had 86 pitches, 55 were strikes, 10 swings and misses. Um, he credited his cutter as a pitch that has been a big one for him. Um, I wasn't able to confirm with him if, uh, if that is indeed a slider he's throwing. Baseball Savant says he's throwing a slider. Uh, that could be something else, but he's working in more of his breaking ball stuff because he's mostly been a fastball changeup dude when he's with the Padres and a fastball changeup guy in the uh, brief time he spent with the Twins before Tommy John. But he's mixing in more breaking ball stuff. I don't envision Chris Paddock um, getting up to like an ace level, but I do believe Chris Paddock can be a very serviceable pitcher for the Twins. And yes, you'd like to see a little bit deeper into games, but I think there's been enough signs to point to, okay, there's something to build upon here, and this isn't going to be a train wreck. This is a guy coming off another Tommy John surgery. But I, I saw you saw pretty good signs of life, and against these Dodgers, when you have to go against 1-2-3 and Betts, Otani, and Freeman, and you hold your own against them, you can pat yourself on the back for sure. Yeah, and this is a guy that I... I mean, you look back to his days with the Padres, and his ERA and just the way that he would attack uh, batters... He, he does like to be a little more, I think, attacking of the zone. He he, he says, if you're going to beat me, I want you to beat me straight up. I'm not going to dance around the zone. I'm going to attack the zone, make sure that if you put the ball in play, and this is kind of what we talked about uh, a few days ago, he knows he has decent defense behind him. You see Byron Buxton covering everything out there in center field and now healthy. That's fantastic. Uh, you have Carlos Correa on that, uh, I guess, where, with your perspective, that left side of the infield, that shortstop. Um, and Eddie Julian, like you said, his defense – looked like it improved and it looks like it could be improving here so if you have that middle infield as a pretty reliable thing if you just induce some ground balls um chris paddock i think could be like you said he's not going to get to an ace level you don't expect him to and that's the thing the bar is not set incredibly high for chris paddock the bar is set at i don't want to be tearing you down after a performance and i don't think that to, like today if he goes out there and does what he did today multiple times the rest of the season and this is going to be a guy that i think you're going to be relatively surprised by in, in a sense where it's a pleasant tenure, it's a good 2024, um, but I think you could probably expect him to settle in a little bit more. At the Sheriff, I looked it up, it, it's from Texas, so that makes a little more sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, but, uh, yeah, maybe the Sheriff can wrangle in a few more outlaws and, uh, you know, send some guys to the, uh, the 
Boondocks? I don't know. I'm trying to think of what. Uh, the the what, what's like a? Were you a Red Dead Redemption fan? Did you play Red oh, Dead yeah. at all? Yeah. What, what's that? What's that thing? The the gallows? You send them to the gallows? Yeah, the gallows. Or? There we go. Yeah. I think that's it. Exactly. Our Red Dead fans here on on Score North Twin Shore screaming their heads off right now. Like, no, you idiots. Uh, they are. <laughs> they. The twins, that is, are going to be missing out on a genius promotion. They need to do a 10-gallon hat for the sheriff. Uh, if, if they, I know they always oh, do their pre, their you know preseason ones. They should definitely mix that one in because it would be a it'd be a killer. Sticking on the pitching side, so yeah. an interesting kind of bullpen usage day. Cody Funderburg comes and gets a humongous out against Max Muncy, who took Paddock deep earlier in the inning. That was a good lefty on lefty uh, atcha. And then Hori Alcala, who was there was some concerns because he left Sunday's game in the basically right before the inning started. And everyone kind of assumed, oh, here we go again with Jorge Alcala. No, he's just fine. He pitches in back-to-back -back games, helps bridge the gap a little bit. And then they go Brock Stewart into Griffin Jacks. Um, and then, obviously, they were able to close the game uh, with, with the left-hander, uh, Cody, F not Thunderbrook, excuse me. Who am I blanking on right now? I do Okert. not have this mix. Okert, Stephen Okert, thank you. Uh, so they go Stewart Jacks into Okert. And... Okert ends up getting the ninth inning, and Jax, who struck out the side in the eighth, there, I asked Rocco about, did Griffin Jax want to go out there for the ninth? Was there a plan for Griffin Jax to go out there in the ninth? Because basically what was going to happen was either Jax was going to have to play some lefties, or the Twins were going to have to bring in Okert, and Dodge were going to empty their bets you know, for Taylor and Smith for right-handers from a lefty-on-righty matchup, too. So no matter what, there was going to be some type of disadvantage. Rocco ended up electing to go with Okert because he thought that would give him the best opportunity. Now, I will say if Jax had come out there and there was some trouble, I bet Okert likely does get out there to probably face Otani. I know that sounds kind of funny on the surface, but Otani into Freeman, lefty, lefty there. If trouble had arose there in the top of the ninth, I think that's what was going to happen. He also, Rocco, that has also told me that no matter what, Oker was probably going to get into the today's matchup. I think just the way things were dialing up, they wanted to preserve a lead with Stewart into Jack 7th and 8th. And actually, I love that because you shouldn't just be saving your best relievers for when the game is over. You should be using your best relievers in high leverage situations. And when Stewart and Jax are coming into the game, Stewart, that is, I mean, he has to face the top of the order. Jax gets the heart of the order in the 4, 5, 6. So actually ends up things kind of line up perfectly where then it's Steven Oker getting 7, 8, 9, and I know there are some pinch hitting opportunities. I actually appreciate that strategy. We've kind of gotten away in a good way from only use your closer and your best pitcher for the 8th and ninth inning. No, no, no. You should use your best pitchers in the high leverage situations, and Rock was able to do that today. And quick round of applause, Stephen Oker. Congratulations on your first career MLB save. A guy that has been in the league since 2016 yeah. across the Giants, the Marlins, now in Minnesota. Almost 200 career innings pitched, first career save, and I, so credit to him for one, getting the job done. But two, he looks relatively comfortable because you have a lengthy, and relatively lengthy, I would say, video review of a what could have been a game-ending double play that gets overturned. Top of the lineup. Mookie Betts staring you down. He induces a pop-up in the infield. Otani's on deck. That's enough to scare me silly. So congratulations, Stephen Okert. And I think going to the bullpen here, as you, as you look at the box score, you get Paddock, and then you get Thunderbunk. Thunderbird, excuse me. He gets the uh, he gets the win. And then you go Alcala, hold. Stewart, hold. Jax, hold. Okert, save. That is, I mean, this is the Dodgers. This is not the Oakland A's. This is not the Kansas City Royals here. This is the Los Angeles Dodgers who use it. I mean, you've seen the past couple of days. They make any ballpark their home uh, friendly con confines. So um, you said it, Rocco, using your good relievers in high leverage situations. And those guys come through and they go toe to toe with one of the best teams in baseball. And the bullpen wins you this game. I mean, Eddie Julian. I, I probably might be the first star of this game if you do it like the hockey system of first, second, third with the two home runs. But the bullpen, a collective effort. It's not just one guy going out there. You didn't have a Tyler Glasnow go into the seventh inning like he, he did last night for uh, the Dodgers. You have the bullpen come in and just shut it down inning after inning, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, big matchups, and they come through, come out on top of the Dodgers. And that's uh, I think that's a nice little boost to the ego moving forward, especially in a big series like I already uh, has said, and I will reiterate with the Tigers here starting tomorrow. Yeah, and by the way, Caleb Thielbar probably returning to the bullpen um, this weekend in Detroit. Duran is close. I don't know okay. if we'll see Duran immediately, but Thielbar is definitely ahead of schedule, which is a good sign. So some reinforcements are on the way to that Twins bullpen, and then there will be probably 
some difficult decisions that have to take place. Uh, we'll see what kind of happens there. Haven't really, I have personally haven't really thought too much of how that shakes out. Matt Walner is off to a shaky start. I don't know if they'll send him down due to the injury to Max Kepler. So a lot of interesting moving parts once the Bar does return. Uh, obviously, I'd be uh, remiss if I did not bring up the probably what was the turning point in this game in the top of the seventh uh, when Freddie Freeman slaps one down the line and Alex Kirloff has some trouble picking up the ball in the right field foul pull. He's able to scoop it up, get it into Correa, who delivers an absolute dart. In fact, it was, I believe, the fastest or second fastest relay throw, 92 miles an hour from Correa, basically in short right, about 20 feet, 20 feet or so past the second base, normal depth side, delivers a dart to Vasquez. The umpire originally rules this safe. Um, that was the, one of the quickest reviews you're going to see. He was clearly out, uh, but Correa with a huge turning point in the game. And Correa's, uh, uh, Correa's bat has definitely been able to kind of bring back here after an injury riddled season in 2023 but defensively he remains just incredible and that defensive play I mean that was basically ends up being a humongous turning point in the ball game and when you have someone like Correa who can do that and the twins look pre-Correa we're throwing out every single person imaginable at short when you have Carlos Correa there and I know he's paid a lot of money but he's worth every single penny and he basically saved the twins from potentially losing this ball game to the LA Dodgers on Wednesday. And that kind of the secondary star there, the, the assist maker, if you will, to that Carlos Correa relay, who is a guy that I think, I mean, he's a 256 hitter career. So it's been a very rough start to the season for him, but Christian Vasquez, how about this guy defensively? Because we, we've seen him already, uh, multiple throwdowns to second that where they get the runner. And then it, it it's one thing to get the throw there and, you know, be in a position, but it's another to actually make the tag, apply it to a guy like Shohei Otani, who is running, you know, however fast he's able to get up to 20 ish miles per hour, charging around third base, looking to score. Um, it, he, those two guys have been able to connect on uh, a couple steel uh, attempts and now relays. And I mean, to be able to have a guy like Carlos Correa out there in the infield, and, and that just shows, it's like you said, it's hit down the, the first base line, gets to the corner. He's just, he's able to do it really from everywhere. Um, it, that's just how the relay does set up. But it, it, it it's incredible that this team, when you talk about what they should be able to do at the plate, they also, despite how maybe cloudy that's been to start the year, they're able to do it defensively too. So it, it, it seems like Dex, all the pieces are there it's just you got to put the puzzle together because right now you're getting the bullpen some days, you're getting the defense some days. Um, you know, you you get your Pablo day, and you know that comes through. But when it comes later on in the year, you're gonna get some of those things overlapping. The Venn diagram is not just solo circles anymore. You're gonna have some overlap, and that's when this team I think is really gonna start to be dangerous. But unfortunately, the problem is they're not really stringing together those type of overlaps this part. Uh, you know, this early in the year. And to your point, Edge, I mean, baseball is a hard sport. It's hard to have all soul, all three of those aspects, pitching, defense, hitting, to be working for you all uh, every single time. Usually there's one uh, weak link in that chain reaction that kind of hinders you from winning a game. Otherwise, every team could go 162-0. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I, the, the offense is probably the biggest thing they have to find more consistency with. You know, the starting's been okay. The bullpen, I think, has been great, and they, they have been without some reinforcements too, so that's been probably their best strength. Today, yes, Buxton, you know, as we saw in the score on our social graphic from our excellent Photoshop team, uh, Byron Buxton's able to snap the 0 for 33 runners in scoring position drought. But as a whole, still, the Twins go 1 for 9 today with runners in scoring position. So something they'll definitely still have to figure out. But I, I just thought in general, offensively, that there was enough there to say, okay, Julian ends up, you know, parking some baseballs, and he has some productive at-bats. Correa's glove and bat are still pretty good. Uh, Buxton delivers an RBI single. I know he had a couple strikeouts. Austin Martin, rightfully so, deserved a move up in the lineup, and he was able to bat, you know, six today after batting ninth, collecting his first major league hit last night. So there's some things here that I thought were positives, but now you're going to go to Detroit, and now you get to see another divisional team, and Detroit's off to a hot start. Can you go in there, and at the very least, can you take two? Can you take two of these four games in Detroit? You start feeling a little bit, little bit better about your approach, and I think also how they win games and how they lose games, right? Like if the offense starts to pick things up a little bit, to your point about all three of those things coming together, um, things can start kind of piecing together and you start seeing together what, what a good baseball team can look like and a big series coming up with the Detroit Tigers this weekend. Yeah, and, and 
the offense, it's, it is a little, I will say, it, it's concerning right now, but it's so early in the year where I see a lot of the discourse on maybe tw Twins Twitter and, and, and Twins Facebooks and, all you know, the Twins Reddit, where it's, we have to overhaul, we have to fire the hitting coach, we have to, you know, go sign somebody. Let's calm down a little bit here because it, it, it is something to keep in the back of your mind. And when you look at, uh, you know, the lineup from today, you have four of your nine batters batting under 200. That is a concern. But the thing is, and I think this is very promising, how often, and this is last year, and granted he was battling the plantar fasciitis, fasciitis, however you do say it, Carlos Correa is notoriously a slow starter to the year, right? 324 at this point, 10 games in. You would like maybe a little more pop at times. You would like uh, maybe a, a little more of that... Uh, bunched up where you have the Julian Correa Kirilov triple threat there at the top or you know Buxton follow suit right after Correa and he's even batting 237 so there's room to improve there for him but Carlos Correa I think that's I mean that's been their big key signing the past couple of years extending him having him come back here despite tickling things with other uh the Giants with the Mets where was he gonna go it was the where's Waldo of of baseball where's Carlos Correa gonna land um it was important that they got him back and they did and, you know, he's he's here, it seems like, for a decent stint. And it, to start this season, he's been rot, red hot. Like, it seems like that rust that you get from a, a Carlos Correa season almost got shaken off in spring training so far. So you're getting almost, you know, maybe April, or I guess late April, almost maybe June Carlos Correa here in the very first part of the season. So if he can find that mid-season form, mid-summer form, um, that's going to be a guy that, is so beneficial at the top of your lineup. It can really keep that flow going in the order because if you have that solid two, three hitter, I mean, that changes your approach. It changes the pitcher's approach too. every single at bat because it's okay. We have to dance around here and all of a sudden maybe they get nervous. We don't want to walk uh, that second batter colors. Correa's third. And now you have a guy on first. Oh, and now we're nervous. And now Kirilov Buxton, they're there to capitalize. Um, so offense, it's an issue, but I think the key players, Correa, Buxton, you're seeing it a little bit, and Kirilov has been fantastic as well. Um, it, it, let's let's pump the brakes here. Let's reevaluate after Detroit. Hey, by the way, the Element Hotel just steps away here uh, from Target Field, a great spot. Uh, so if you're looking for a little staycation, maybe you're coming in from out of town, maybe you're an opponent, uh, a fan of another team, you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, where can I stay close to Target Field? We go to the Element Hotel. It's being shown right there on our YouTube channel for our audio audience. You can uh, also uh, get, get, it, get it a great rate there as well. They have complimentary breakfast. They have a fitness center. Uh, it is an awesome spot, just steps away from Target Field, and you can stay in your element with the eco-friendly spaces at the Element Hotel in downtown Minneapolis. Plus, the hotel is also pet-friendly, uh, so you can book your next stay for a Twins game. Book your next stay for a night out in the North Loop, heck, in Minneapolis here uh, at the Element Hotel Minneapolis. Shout out to them for uh, sponsoring the Score North Twin Show. We appreciate them. All right, Age, uh, that's going to wrap it up here from Target Field. Yeah, Twins entering now a road trip. Uh, they only win one game on this homestand. We'll see what happens in Detroit. Uh, so some Score North extra innings content will likely be trickling in uh, to your feeds over the next few days from Detroit and from the road as well. So we appreciate you guys. So hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. We thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This is Score North Extra Innings. My name is Dak Goff. That's AJ Fredrickson, and we'll see you next time.